Hello. Hello, my name is Jody, Jody Skulls, and I am your instructor for the MBLEX review course. I am delighted to be here today. Uh, today, we are talking about guidelines to a professional practice. Super boring. Um, you probably have heard it all before. Um, and yet, uh, it actually is so important uh, to go over this stuff uh, just because guidelines to a professional practice and ethics, boundaries, principles, laws, that type of stuff, it is all um, lumped into two categories. Um, and the reason we spend two, at least two classes on this topic of guidelines to a professional practice is because there are 31 questions on your test on this topic. I mean, this is common sense stuff, um, but we still have to get to the best answer, right? So uh, I am delighted to, uh, to be your instructor. And also one of my great joys is to celebrate when you guys pass. So I love, 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 love to hear from you when you pass. Uh, and I would encourage you to consider after you pass, continuing to stay active in this community after the first of the year, active in the patron community. After the first of the year, we're going to be doing uh, some first year best practices. So the year, a year of mastery is what we're gonna be doing. Uh, and it's just some, some simple stuff that it, I have found that in the first year of your practice um, that it's really helpful to know. And it's, you know, some anatomy, some physiology, we'll talk more about that next week. Um, but, uh, but just know, I'd encourage you to consider to stay um, a, as a patron uh, and maybe not to study for the Umblex once you pass, uh, but to be a part of the community that is uh, in their first year of mastery. So, um, and we have four people to celebrate. Oh my God, I'm so excited. We have four people to celebrate. I think I mentioned Dee Dee last week, but Dee Dee passed her Mblex. Sophie passed her Mblex. Sandy Davidson passed her Mblex. I haven't even gotten the notice up yet. I just found out. And yesterday, Allison passed her Mblex. And I wanted to share with you what she said, because um, it, it really touched my heart. She said, when the gentleman, this is Allison's words to me yesterday at 1020 in the morning. Uh, Allison says, when the gentleman handed me my results paper, I stood there and I cried. Another gentleman came out and asked me if they could give me a hug because they knew my anxiety level going in. He brought me a tissue and I literally sat in the lobby for a few minutes and just let the tears roll. And so um, it says, you know, uh, thank you again for being there for me. I've sent your patron link to many and will continue to do so. Um, hugs, 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 Allison. Yay. I know you guys feel that same type of anxiety, that same type of drive, that same type of passion to get this done. And that is in and of itself, the feeling of that passion, the feeling of really wanting to get it done. That is the evidence. That's the evidence that you're meant to do this work. You know, back in the day, um, it, there were different times. Well, I shouldn't say back in the day, there's a saying um, in some churches that, you know, we need to know God's will for our life, right? We need to know God's will for our life. You guys, here's, spoiler alert, here's the insight. The desires of your heart are God's will for your life. Whether you believe in God or not, um, or, or whatever, like I don't consider myself a religious person, um, but I do consider myself a spiritual person. And I wanted to share with you that this desire, the fact that you're listening um, to this lesson, the fact that you're here and participating in class tells me that you have a desire in your heart. You have a desire in your heart to pass. And just know that that is God's, the universe, um, you know, divine order, whatever you want to call that power that's outside, bigger inside us, that's kind of angels, that this is the evidence that this is what is for you. And, you know, this test, you know, we got this. It doesn't come just from us, though. I mean, honestly, like Allison said, 
um, she didn't know when I, if you've seen the little video of me right after I took the Mplex, I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I, you could have told me I got every question wrong. You could have told me I got every question right. I really didn't know. But I knew that this is a desire of my heart and that in essence, it was meant to be. So I wanted to share that with you today to encourage you on those days where it's like, ugh, the anatomy coloring book. That's fun though, it is fun. Um, or just you know, just those, um, those challenging days. You know, we're moving into a colder season and that can sometimes feel down and in, right? When it's overcast or cold. Um, and so just, just know that this is your season. We have eight more classes. Today is, you know, the last of an eight week cycle. We have eight more classes before the end of the year. Bring it, bring it. All right. So uh, for those of you who might be new to class uh, today, our classes are in three parts. The first part is strategy to stay on track before, during, and after the MBLEX. Strategies about the MBLEX, how to prepare for it properly. And it's not just memorization, right? We've, you know, you've heard me say this before. Um, but it's really learning how to test. And that's as important as your knowledge. You can have, you could sit down, you could be a doctor, you could be a nurse, you could have all the knowledge you need. And when you go into this test, you still have to have the test taking strategies. So in part one of our class, we always talk about um, the mindset of the emblex. The, the the tools that are needed uh, as far as the testing side of things. Then we learn, learn, learn. Uh, we do some content. We review what uh, many of you have had in class and many of you haven't. Um, there are different types of massage schools out there. Some take their, their lessons more seriously than others. And so if you went to one of those schools, that didn't um, take their studies as seriously as they could have, you're here now, you're here now. I've had more than one student, one more than one graduate tell me that the school they went to was a shit show. Yeah, those aren't my words, they're, that's their words. Um, and they're out there, but now you're here. You're here and you're gonna get in what you need. So in part two, we, we review and we relearn or learn uh, some uh, knowledge that you will need to know, um, not only to pass the test, but to practice safely. And then in the third part of class, we dissect questions. So let's get into it. All right, from this slide. Oh, no, no, not a new slide. Don't do that. Slideshow. There we go from the custom slide. There we go. Trying to make it pretty for you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience with my technology too. There's sometimes uh, just some, some uh, hiccups in the presentation, but welcome back to the Emblex Review course. Who am I? I'm Jody Scholes. I've been a licensed massage therapist since 1994. Um, worked with a lot of elite pro athletes, worked um, for DC United, uh, which is major league soccer. A lot of the guys going into world cup um, coming up here in a month or so, um, have been clients that uh, you see here, um, a triathlete. Oh, you can see over there too. There's a picture of DC United one year when they won down here in the lower right-hand corner. There's me in the back. Um, yeah. And so, um, I'm also former adjunct therapy, uh, you know, with, at uh, Northern Virginia Community College and have been teaching this MBLEX review class for you, uh, for a bunch of years now since 2016. So that's me and why, um, I'm here. Well, that's who I am. But why I'm here is because massage makes the world a better place. Yes, it does. And you are going to be making a wonderful difference in the world as a licensed massage therapist. Even now, in keeping your hands on people, you create such a positive change. It's like the analogy of throwing a stone into a quiet pond. And you know those ripples that you see? When you give a massage, the ripples, 
yes, you help that one person. The one person is the stone, right? But then that one person, they're like a nicer human being because you gave them a massage for real. They may be more patient with their kids. They may be more patient in traffic. Maybe they're nicer to their coworkers. Maybe they're more patient when they can't get something open or like their life is better. It actually creates a ripple effect because they're nicer to the people that they are in their lives. That's how important, that's my why. Because I know massage makes the world a better place. And I know you guys are gonna be doing great things um, as a licensed massage therapist. So I uh, wanted to mention that um, there are a lot of challenges, you know, common challenges um, to taking the test, right? I'm trying to get us so that this toolbar doesn't block your image at all. There we go. So let's put it there. All right. Um, so common challenges to taking um, the the emblex. And you you guys have, have experienced this yourself. Um, most of the people in class um, have taken the emblex at least twice. Just saying, you guys are the motivated ones, you know, and you've seen this fear, anxiety, um, ineffective study sessions or ineffective school. Um, maybe they gave you meaningless homework. Um, maybe they told you memorization was the only tool. Um, but we all deal with rushing through test questions. And, you know, we start off with weak test taking stamina. And so what's cool about this um, is that, look at this, you can control all these things. We've talked about controlling what you can control. I like to remind you in this class to control on game day. On the day you're taking the test, that's game day, baby. Control what you can control. You can control your mindset. You can, it might be, it might, you know, it might take chocolate. It might take coffee. I mean, it might take ice cream, but getting yourself in that positive mindset, you can control all of these things. Um, and so that's the empowering part of this process. These are not challenges that are against you. They are actually for you. What do I mean by that? How can like inconsistent studying be for me? Well, when we realize that we're doing inconsistent studying, when we realize that we're in the midst of fear and anxiety, then we control it. Yeah. And so you get to control what you can control. That is part of our preparing our mindset for the emblex. Now let's move into the actual content for today and that's guidelines for professional practice. Let's take a look. Yeah, we're good, all right. So we're gonna be talking about scope of practice versus standards of practice. And an analogy I really enjoy is these navigational beacons. You see the boat? is there's a lighthouse here and there's a, um, a beacon here and there's a Jimmy Buffett song that says, keep it within the navigational beacons. You know, and that's just staying on track, right? Our guidelines to a professional practice help us stay on track. And there's a lot of places where we've read about massage therapists that go off track, but let's look at the common language, the best practices that we're gonna be taking into um, not only into our practice, but into the test. So scope of practice, it's a term that means what we are allowed to do, when, where, how, why specific methods are applied. So the scope of our practice, right? What we're allowed to do. So we are not allowed to diagnose or prescribe, right? Diagnose, say, oh, you have an ACL injury, you have a meniscus injury. We're not allowed to diagnose. That's out of the scope of our practice. So we're gonna be talking about what activities are allowed within the scope of practice. So we know if we're tested, uh, when we're tested on what is allowed and what isn't. 
So this, we are generally allowed to perform manipulation on soft tissues and your license to practice massage therapy also allows you to work within energy, um, energy modalities. Things, you may not be certified in Reiki and I don't um, recommend, I recommend you don't practice Reiki until, or any form of body, uh, energy body work unless you have had training in that. Um, but our license does allow us to, and it does allow us to practice in those energy fields. So we're allowed to introduce Reiki. We're allowed to introduce polarity uh, into our sessions when, when appropriate, and if that works for you. Um, we can't diagnose and we can't prescribe. Um, so we can't prescribe. Um, most people think of that as, as medications, right? If we're writing a prescription, but this also applies to nutrition. We're not allowed to say, you need more vitamin D you need more vitamin C. That is out of the scope of our massage therapy license. Now, if you are a licensed nutritionist, by all means, uh, then you can say those types of things. If you, are, um, if you have your um, certificate in personal training, you are allowed to offer um, a treat a, a recommended treatment of exercise you could put together an exercise protocol but we are not allowed to prescribe treatment in the sense of oh you need to go strengthen your abs no that's actually out of the scope of our practice you can tell stories about your clients who have had low back pain and got out of low back pain by strengthening their abs if that's your experience but in general, the scope of our practice is all about soft tissue manipulation. So soft tissue being muscles, ligaments, um, abdominal massage, those types of things. All right, hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, we are also not allowed to intentionally pop joints. If somewhere along the line you learned that, it's out of the scope of practice, unless you're a chiropractor, unless you're an acupuncturist. You're not going to be dry, you know, dry needling someone if you haven't been through a cert certification program for dry needling, right? I mean, and some massage therapists kind of ride the edge of that border with cupping. Is cupping in or out of the scope of practice? What do you think? Oh, I forgot to mention that there's a chat right here. Here's the chat. So when, if I ask a question, you can answer it in the chat. Um, so is cupping within the scope of our practice? Now, if you got that question on the MLEX, how would you answer? What is the most conservative answer? I know a lot of you get cupping while you're in massage school, right? But if you didn't, it is technically, oh, let me see what our answers are. Oh yes, now if you got cupping at massage school and you got official training and you have a certification or you have proof of that, it is within the scope of your practice. But traditional massage schools, many of them do not teach cupping. So you need to be very careful if you're asked about specific modalities, because our specific scope of practice is about soft tissue. All right, ooh, we got a lot of answers here, hold on. Yeah, mine did not, yes, I see. Um, uh, Kate, yours did, Sharla, um, yes, I see. Yep, technically, the answer there, I wanna be super clear, that it is out, cupping is out of the scope of our practice unless we've had additional training. Traditional massage schools don't teach it. If it has been a part of your protocol, it is absolutely within the scope of your practice. On the test, know that it is typically out of the scope of practice. Likewise, we are talking about realigning the skeleton. We're not gonna be doing chiropractic adjustments, right? I, I, and I have seen some things, you know, 
um, but, you know, joint popping and things like that out of the scope of practice for sure can cause injury. The legal requirements do vary state by state, county by county, town by town. Um, here you'll see um, a map that is almost 100% accurate. Wyoming, Minnesota, and Vermont all have no licensing. Kansas now does have massage licensing. Um, and it is, it, so it does vary um, state by state. In these three states now, Wyoming, Minnesota, and Vermont, there's no state regulation to have a license to practice massage. Can you believe that? Um, but in Minnesota, many jurisdictions do. Um, so just, it, it, and that's why in your own zip code, you get to define out what you need to practice lawfully. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a moment. So it's our standards of practice that we're going over today. Uh, let's see. So this is standards of practice um, uh, put into place by an organization called the NCBTMB possibly the worst acronym ever, um, but the National Certification of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work, the National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work, tongue twister, right? But these are the ones um, that, he, this is the organization that has set up our official standards of practice and what you will be tested on. Uh, one is professionalism. That means uh, knowing, well, knowing your draping, knowing your professionalism. This is, we'll talk more about professionalism in practice um, in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, part of this is draping, part of this is your office practices, part of this is your dress, what you wear, your attire. Um, the word professionalism is different than the word professional. You are a professional who practices professionalism. Gotta watch out for these tricky questions. Yeah. All right, your legal and ethical requirements, they vary state by state. Uh, in the town that I practiced massaged in for many years, um, a little uh, town in uh, Northern Virginia, it's not so little, um, and just outside of Washington, DC, I needed a state license for Virginia I needed a county license for Fairfax County, and I needed a town license from the town of Vienna. Additionally, I needed a business license to practice business in the town of Vienna. That's four things I had to get to practice legally. Double check, and where can you find this out? I'll show you in just a minute. I'm not sure if it's the next slide, but, oh, there we go, yes. Where can you find this out? Uh, so you can go to your local AMTA chapter, Find someone in your local AMTA chapter and they will walk you through it, specifically if they're on the board. Uh, so if they're on um, president, vice president, uh, the treasurer or the secretary, or they'll, they'll be able to direct you. Um, but if you don't have an active AMTA chapter, then you will need to go uh, to your county clerk, to city hall and to ask. Um, and remember there's a difference between your professional license that is, once you pass the MBLEX, you apply for your state's professional license to practice massage therapy. In some um, states, that'll be a certification. The difference is you will almost always need a business license as well. So just make sure you, you get your checklist together on how to practice legally. We cover this not only for when you practice, but if you're tested on a question like this. There's a difference between a professional license and a business license. All right, confidentiality. Yes. So what does that mean? That means that we are not allowed to share information um, about our clients. That means that that comes right down to even that they are a client. If, uh, if time permits, we'll go through a number of these uh, later slides and gives you some scenarios um, on confidentiality. It's, and it's bigger than just HIPAA. The Health Information uh, Portability Act, I'm missing. Um, the Health Information P Privacy and Portability Act. <laughs> so 
Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, oh, Access Act. You'll see it's H I P A A. By the way, it's not like hippo, like hippopotamus. It's H I P A A. A little bit different. HIPAA rules are about confidentiality and the sharing of medical information. And if you don't know that off the, if you if that's new for you, if that term HIPAA is new for you, please do dig in um, and watch the online learning module. Uh, on guidelines to a professional practice because I go into it a lot. So standard number five out of six, business practices. It is expected that you will have professional business practices. You will have set pricing. You will have a health intake form. You will file your taxes. You will pay taxes. Let me just say, it's actually a good thing to pay for taxes. It is. We want to pay taxes. Yeah. We want to pay taxes. That means we're making money. And you know what? Banks like it when you pay taxes. And let me make a pitch uh, to be an employee versus an independent contractor. Being an employee means you start your career as a massage therapist working for someone else. You start your career as a massage or continue your career as a massage therapist by working for somebody else who takes taxes out of your check. Why, why would I care? Why is that important? You know, what's important about that is when you go to buy a car or you go to buy a house, you have a track record of your income and the banks like it a lot more. Now, if you want to blaze a trail and be an entrepreneur, I am. I, I'm, I support you in that. I will tell you it's a little easier as you get started to work for someone else, just to get started. And you may settle in and you may really like it. Don't be lured by the idea of easy money. Oh, Jody, I can make a hundred bucks an hour if I work for myself. You still got to pay taxes. It's a part of your standard of practice for massage therapy. Is It's part of your business practices. You gotta pay um, federal taxes, you gotta pay state taxes, and you might even need to pay local taxes. Yeah, so it's a setting the intention to have professionalism in your business practices. All right, and then roles and boundaries. We'll go into uh, this in more detail, roles and boundaries, meaning understanding your professional role and maintaining um, healthy boundaries with your clients. And we'll give a few examples of what that looks like. Oh, and the last standard, standard number six, uh, the prevention of sexual misconduct. It is important to address sexual misconduct because in massage therapy, it is a very intimate setting. People take off their clothes and they trust you to maintain healthy boundaries, safe boundaries, and to create a safe, non judgmental space for them. And these, you know, kind of interact together, right? Good draping, that sends the message of professional boundaries, that prevents misconduct. And of course, as someone who's becoming a licensed healthcare professional, someone's become you who are becoming a licensed massage therapist, we have the odd situation where a massage therapist is inappropriate. But what we're going to learn is how to deal with clients who may be confused about why they're there. And our standards of practice help us to maintain the prevention of sexual misconduct. So let's talk about that for just a little bit more for, for practical purposes, because I find many times in massage school, there's not clarity. There's some confusion about what happens if a client is inappropriate in the treatment room. Let's walk through the seven step intervention model. This will give you some language. We're gonna cover this a little bit quickly um, because you probably won't be tested on this in the MBLEX. I'm giving this to you for practical reasons. Um, 
Very first step is to take your hands off the client. Second step is to ask a clarifying question. Third out of seven steps, assess the answer. Number, step number four could be to educate the client or to give feedback to the client. Then you get to, in step five, decide if you wanna continue or not with the session. You will receive payment in full and you will document the experience. Hands off, this is to make eye contact, make sure the client is, is draped. Um, this is just a time you're going to um, speak in a very grounded man matter, but you're gonna take your hands off the client. If there is some type of yellow or red flag that has come up, if your intuition is telling you something's not right, pause. Take your hands off the client. Go into the second step. Describe the behavior that you're concerned about. I noticed you're, um, you made a comment about my appearance and then made a sexual joke. You know, describe the behavior that concerns you. If you see an erection, there's two, two, three reasons for an erection. One, the client has to pee. Two, the client has fallen asleep. Three, the client is sexually aroused. If we're gonna take our hands off and ask a clarifying question, I see there's been a physical change in your body. Are you uncomfortable? Now you're going to assess the, ask the clarifying question and assess the answer. If they say, oh, baby, baby, I'm very comfortable. Okay, guess what? Session's over. Yeah, there's no coming back from an inappropriate com comment. There's no, oh, I didn't mean it. I, oh, 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 I was just joking. Uh-uh. That's predatory behavior. That's narcissistic behavior. They meant every word. It is time to, well, you get to assess the answer, right? That's step number four. And you get to step number five, decide whether to continue or not. No, I, no I'm sorry. No, it won't happen again. No. Your intuition is your indicator that it is time to wrap up that session. So assess the answer. Yes. Dot, oh, and then um, you will receive payment in full. And this is a great reason to work at least at first in a group practice or for someone else. Because when you are taking payment, there are other people in the, in the building. There is maybe a receptionist or maybe more than one receptionist. And so you finish the session in 25 minutes and that receptionist is gonna be like, hey, is everything okay? And you'll be like, no, he made an inappropriate comment. That's when you have the benefit of being with someone and maybe feeling a little less anxious, a little less um, intimidated or weird. Yeah. And your safety is my first concern. So um, you will receive payment in full and hopefully with another person. And then you'll document the situation. So you document the situation in their chart. In some practices, that client will not be allowed to return. This is a judgment call, but in the world of taking the emblex, inappropriate comments, inappropriate behavior is not allowed. The session is ended. You instruct the client to go ahead and get up, get dressed and meet you out front. And then you document the situation. So you demonstrate your commitment to ethics and professionalism by reporting that you've sought supervision or external support to address the situation. So documenting the situation, asking your supervisor, asking um, uh, supervision can be from someone like me um, who's been in the practice for quite some time. It could be external support. Um, yeah, 
And so we'll talk more about that later uh, if we need to. So that's the seventh step in the, in the seven step intervention model. And here's where you can find it. This has been adapted from a book called The Ethics of Touch, a hands-on practitioner's guide to creating a professional, safe and enduring practice. Thank you, Cherie Sonimo and Ben Benjamin. Thank you for that work. All right, let's go through a few definitions. We're doing well on time. So these words are almost interchangeable. Ay, 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 these are tricky, um, but let's, Let's get down to what these definitions are. We're going to talk about ethics, principles, values, how those differ from morals, how, uh, what is the definition of integrity, and then laws. Sounds like fun, right? Yeah, not so much. Stretch a little. Roll your shoulders back. All right, take a sip of water. Mm -hmm. We still get to dissect questions after we uh, cover this material, so. All right, ethics. Ethics are the moral principles that govern a person's behavior. So ethics are not written down like laws, right? They didn't get passed by the House of Representatives and um, the Senators and the Congress, and they're not laws. Ethics, our moral principles and they govern our behavior and they differ culture to culture, right? So moral principles, they govern your behavior and sometimes they govern a group's behavior. So ethics, so for example, um, there's organizations um, that like the SPCA or the, um, PETA, I don't know what that stands for, but it's a pet industry um, that likes to protect pets, right? So SPCA, no kill um, shelters for animals. That's a moral principle, right? It's a guiding principle. Yeah. And it's not necessarily written down as a law, but it's ethics. It's the moral principles that drive those decisions. What are principles? Well, principles are rules or they can be the rules of behavior. So their principles are the laws of behavior. So the rules of behavior, they're not written down again. Some principles are like if, if you go to a certain college or a certain high school, they may say, hey, here's how we, here's how we do things. But in general, society is not punishing you for having bad principles. So having good principles, rules or laws of behavior that enable a person to behave with integrity. So these are, our, this is your moral compass, if you will, your principles. Um, so one quote, I believe that respect and kindness are two important principles that we learn in regard to how to treat people. So our principles, our, govern our behavior. And again, they come from hopefully our moral compass. Values. Don't all these words sound the same? I know, right? Values are the principles and beliefs that influence the behavior, again, the way of life of a particular group. You know, they can, so the values, um, here's a quote by a, an author who is just a tremendous author guy named Stephen Covey. And he says, peace of mind comes when your life is in harmony with your true principles and values. No other way. Yeah. So these are like values are like long lasting belief systems carried on um, maybe by your culture, um, by your synagogue, by your church. Um, Values indicate in this community what is desirable or undesirable. Yeah, I see a comment. These all really sound the same. I know, I know, I know. They all sound a lot alike. There will be key words within the description. If you get these words, 
Um, I show them to you now because they all do sound the same. Um, if you get these words on your emblex, look for some key phrases, which we'll cover in, in our dissecting questions today, um, to indicate which direction you're going. Um, but values typically are a part of a culture. Um, they, de they determined um, desirable and undesirable behavior. Values are also not written down. Some people make a value statement, some people will write it down, but again, it's not the laws of society, right? It's not that um, the police are gonna punish you for having bad values. All right. Morals, morals and values, they drive each other. So morals are a person's standard of behavior. So morals set the standard. Typically morals apply to right and wrong. Um, although once, um, depending on how you were raised, you can expand um, your thinking uh, to consider there is no right or wrong, that it is all good. But we do have a moral compass. Um, and so it's a standard of behavior. It's a belief system. Um, so what's good, what's acceptable. I know, sounds very similar, right? Gonna have to dissect the question, baby. Gonna have to find the stem of that question. What are they actually asking in that question if these words show up on your emblex? Integrity, we only have two more here. Integrity, um, this is a word uh, that if you're in, uh, if you were in massage school, this is something that probably came up to act with integrity. Um, it's the quality of being honest. It's the quality of having strong moral principles, having integrity, coming from that place of your knowing what is good, what is right for you, what is in alignment. Integrity could also be considered what's in alignment for you. Yeah. How do they show up? You keep your agreements, you be true to your principles, you be true to yourself. And sometimes acting with integrity is difficult. The last one's an easy one, laws. A law is a binding um, practice. It is, um, it is a codified rule of conduct. It, it codified just meaning it's, you know, it's been written down, it's been given a number, it's been explained, what does it look like? When this, this is how we do things around here by the law. And it's usually enforced. So there's an enforcement to laws. All right. Little stretch break. Okay. Little stretch break. Roll the shoulders. Ah. Yes. It, it, that may have felt like a confusing section. That's okay. I would rather you be confused and frustrated now or while you're taking practice exams um, than to be confused and frustrated during the MBLEX. And let me also say that Guidelines to a Professional Practice, part one, goes into great detail about all of this stuff. And that's in the Online Learning Center where you get a subject matter specific quiz to go along with it. 25 to 30 questions all about Guidelines to a professional practice, standards of practice, and scope of practice. All right, are you ready to dissect some questions? All right, good, let's do it. The definition of a principle. All right, we are going through these dissecting questions to learn how to dissect a question. Whether you get this question right or wrong, like right now, if you're looking at it going, oh my gosh, I can't remember. That's fine. That's normal. 
We are going to go through the practice of dissecting the question so that when you're taking your emblex, you have a process. If you see a question that you don't know the answer to right away, even if you do, I still recommend you go through this process. So the question, we want to fully understand the question. The definition of principles. What are principles? Hmm. All right. So is it a binding custom or practice of a community? B, rules or laws of behavior that enable a person to behave with integrity. C, a person's standard of behavior or beliefs concerning what is, what is and is not acceptable for them to do. Our thoughts on right and wrong. The definition of principles, moral principles that govern a person or a group's behavior. Out of those four answers, can you pick one that's definitely not right? You just know, okay, that's not right. Okay, I see some stuff coming in the chat. Let's see. All right. So we get some different. So a binding custom or practice of the community. That was one answer. Um, so... Would the definition of principles have the word principle in it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of people agree with A. Yep. I see some people saying B, C. I see, oh, I see a lot of Ds. All right. Let's move to the next screen. We're going to just move away from one answer. Okay. We wanted to point out on letter B, it says rules or laws of behavior that enable a person to behave with integrity. But we know on letter D, moral principles is not going to probably be the definition of principles. So we're dissecting the question here. It may feel confusing, but you'll get more used to it. Hopefully it feels systematic. All right. See a lot of people saying it's not A and it's not D. Let's move, rule out A and D. Oh, best answer. You may have seen it. it. The answer, the definition of principles is rules or laws of behavior that enable a person to behave with integrity. Let's see. Excellent. I see, yes, I see lots of people. Oh, good, good, good. Good job. All right, Reva. All right, Kate, you got in there. I didn't even ask the question, but you guessed it right. Good job. Blank are codified rules of conduct set forth by a society generally based on shared ethical or moral principles. Possible answers, ethics, learning styles, integrity, and laws. Hmm. Let's go through the rationale. Ooh, I see answers coming in. I love it. I love it. You got, you got some, some are out, right? B is out, right? So let's walk through this together. So I see your answers coming in and I know you guys are getting good at dissecting questions. What's the question really asking? So we start there with the stem. We find the stem of the question. So we see here, codified rules of conduct, right? Codified, it's highlighted. Shared ethical or moral principles. What's the question really asking? Blank are codified rules of conduct. Codified rules of conduct, remember? Mm hmm Let's eliminate two wrong answers. Are learning styles codified rules? No. Are assessments codified rules? Let me look in your chat. Exactly, Kate. Your, your Kate shares a good point, and that is um, putting the word in front in the blank, and then reading it. So assessments are codified rules of conduct set forth by a society. No, that's uh that is that doesn't make any sense, right? So we can get rid of that. Now we're down to two. You have a 50-50 shot. And I like your chances at 50-50, right? Ethics are codified rules of conduct set forth by a society generally based on shared ethical or moral principles. 
Laws are codified rules of conduct set forth by a society, generally based on shared ethical and moral principles. Make your guess. If you're not driving or operating heavy machinery, please put your uh, answer in the chat. So codified rules. Remember when I said codified rules of conduct? That means they're written down. This is the one where you could get a penalty. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see, let's see. You ready? Pick your best answer. Bang, it's laws. You know, here's the, here's the clue. Well, laws are codified rules, right? Think about when you maybe have seen a law written out you know how they've got those, you know, okay, this is Roman numeral number one, letter A, dot, dot, you know, there's, it, it is written out so that you know exactly what the, what the rules of conduct are. Also, the word ethics and ethical, we're not going to get a definition that has the word in it. Just saying. All right. So Kate offered us some great uh, feedback on that saying, put the word right in there and read it to see if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Sharla mentions that the, the uh, answer won't be easily given to you. And um, that's in their study guide, in the FSMTB's study guide. It won't be easy, I know, um, and that's okay. This is an example of a hard question. And remember that if you're getting a hard question, that means that you've already answered a bunch of easy questions. In the computer adaptive test, which is what the, F what the MBLEX is, it's an adaptive test. You'll answer some questions that are easier and then the test will adapt to make it harder. If you answer those questions correctly, it'll adapt to make it harder. This is an example of a hard question. And the adapting part sounds like a little unfair, right? It's like, ah, why are you giving me harder questions? Ah. Um, no, man, guess what? You actually earn more points from the harder questions. Your goal is to score 630 points out of those 100 questions. You want, you want to get to this point where answering some hard questions. That means you're doing good. Yeah. All right. We I think we have time for one more. We do, oh, we have time for one more. Let's go. Oh, it, when you take the online learning, uh, the practice exam, the big practice exam, you'll see this um, purple bubble sometimes pop up and it'll give you the rationale. So I'm gonna leave that for now so we get our one more question in, but here's the rationale on why this answer is correct. Why ethics is a philosophy of right or wrong while laws are codified rules of conduct. All right. What ribs do not attach to the sternum? Anatomy, didn't we, aren't we just doing guidelines? Yes, we were. But the emblex is gonna have you flip like back and forth between different things. So we're throwing in an anatomy question. What ribs do not attach to the sternum? Ribs six through 12, ribs one and two and eight through 12. Ribs one and eight through 12, Ribs eight through 12. What ribs do not attach to the sternum? Why I love this question, because it says do not attach. What ribs do not attach? Did you realize that your brain cannot hear the word not? It doesn't recognize it. We have to be uber careful when we get these reverse questions. It's not asking what ribs attach to the sternum. It's asking the ribs that are free floating, the ribs that are not attached. Where's the sternum? 
right? Our breastbone. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see answers. I see, I see. Okay. Reba's telling me number two is wrong. All right. Let's see. There's a lot of correct answers that are coming in the chat. Let's go through the process, right? So what are the three main points of the question? We're talking about the ribs. We're talking about the ribs that don't attach, don't attach. And then we're talking, where's the sternum, right? So where's the sternum? So it's not the spine, it's the sternum. All right. Reword the question as a statement is another way to do this. The ribs that do not attach to the sternum are, that sometimes helps your brain to answer, by the way. The ribs that don't attach to the sternum are all right so what do we know about ribs one the rib number one rib number two hmm? let's eliminate the distractors in this uh the this these answers here's another fun piece of information about the emblex every single question has distractors in the answer Distractors are there to actually throw you off. There are a number of these answers that are partially true. And you will find it over and over and over again in the emblex. There will be elements of truth within the answer, but it is not 100% true. It's not 100% accurate. It's not the best answer. Those are called distractors and test question writers, use them on purpose to distract you. That probably didn't happen when you were in massage school, just saying. So we have to eliminate the distractors, try and eliminate two wrong answers. So what do we know about ribs one and two? Let's see. Let's go through the question. So ribs six through 12 seems possible. What do we know about ribs one and two? right? They're way up here, right? So we've got the clavicle and then we start the sternum and ribs wrap all the way around, right? Our rib cage, it makes a cage. So where's rib one and two? Mm -hmm. Right? They're way up here, right? Ribs one and two attach to the sternum for sure. So that's not the right answer. So if rib one isn't the right answer, we can eliminate letter C too. Now we're choosing from two. And that's where we want to be. If we're not sure of the answer, we want to get down to just eliminate the answers we know are wrong, if we can. That's the technique. Ready for the answer? All right. Oh, we got a bunch of answers in the chat. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. So letters A and D both seem plausible. Your best guess. Letter, correct answer is letter D. Ribs eight through 12 do not attach to the sternum. If you take a look at that image, whoops, that image um, of the rib cage, they don't directly attach. They attach through cartilage. Yes, Kate, that's correct. But we also normally, most bodies have two floaters, have two floating ribs that come down the spine that are T11 and T12. Those are often, so the thoracic vertebrae number 11 and thoracic vertebrae number 12, they usually are floaters. They definitely don't attach, um, but technically eight through 12 do not attach. All right, good job, yay. We're done. <laughs> Woo. So next week, um, we're going to be starting a congratulations, by the way. Yay. Pat yourself on the back. This is studying. It's not always easy. It takes a lot of concentration. So good job. Next week, um, we, uh, so which is, if you're today, it, happens to be November 3rd, um, we start a new eight week series. Uh, so that means we have a new Zoom link that'll be coming out. Uh, um, we're gonna take a break on Thanksgiving day. 
duh, because it's a Thursday. And we're going to take a break on December 22nd. So we have 10 weeks left till the end of the year. Can you believe it? Uh, we will be having class on December 29th. Uh, and it will be a, a goal setting class. It'll be a little bit different, um, that class on the 29th. It's really kind of bubbling up. We'll be taking the 22nd off for Christmas, but on the 29th, uh, we're gonna be setting our intentions for the year. We're gonna be setting our intentions um, for it. Like if you've taken the MBLEX, I'm hoping that you've actually taken the MBLEX by then and that we're celebrating you. We're celebrating your success. Um, but uh, we are back on next week. Um, I, and I'm going to wrap up the uh, recording now. Um, and by saying my name again is Jody Scholes. I am a, your, a licensed massage therapist, but I'm also your instructor uh, for the MBLEX review course. So thank you so much for being here. Feel free to hit me up um, okay. in the chat, uh, whether that's on YouTube or on Patreon or on Facebook, through my website, jodyscholes.com. You can get in touch with me that way if you need more details. Um, but for now, looking forward to celebrating with you your good news of passing the MBLEX. All right, catch up soon. <laughs>